of God is the ultimate word because God is the source of all being and therefore the name of all being would be the closest you can get yes. in uh, Jewish numbering of the commandments. It would be the third utterance at Sinai. It says you can't futz around with the name of God. Don't mm -hmm. use it for a vain, silly, trashy reason. Mm -hmm. um, and according to ancient tradition, the name of God was only uttered once a year and it was uttered only by the high priest it was uttered on the holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur, and it was uttered in the holiest place, the temple, in the holiest room, the Devere. Mm -hmm. Now, this name of God, the four-letter name of God, the ultimate word, is made only of vowels. Yud, He, Vav, and He. How do you pronounce all the vowels in any language at once? without sounding like you've just had a great meal or something very sensual or maybe somebody dropped a heavy object on your foot. I mean, it, you can't say only vowels. Right. Nevertheless, that's the name of God. In addition, those three vowel letters, ones repeated, yud, hey, and vav, are the root letters of the verb to be in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Some scholars have suggested that the name of God is actually the name that means the one who brings into being everything that is. Mm -hmm. So now back to the high priest on the holiest day of the year. He's got to go into this room and get off this one ultimate name, the source of all reality and being. If he says it right, the universe falls together. Presumably he says it wrong, everything implodes and it's kaput. It is such a holy event in such a holy place that he and he alone can go into this room. A minor story. A rope is tied around his leg as he walks in. Why? God forbid the man should drop dead of a heart attack while he was in there. Mm -hmm. It's such a holy place no one could go in to reclaim, retrieve the corpse. Gives you the sense. Mm -hmm. So now he goes into the room and he's got to pronounce the name. He's got to recite it somehow, ultimate being. Uh, I'll now tell you and anyone who's listening, in all reverence, even though it'll sound funny, what I believe he said when he was in there, when he said the name of the one who brings into being all that is. This is what he said. All the vowel sounds at once. And then he left. Mm -hmm. The name of all being, the name of all creation, the ultimate word. And in Hebrew, the word for breath is also the same as the word for soul, isn't it? Yes. In, in fact, not just Hebrew, but in Greek and other languages also. When we breathe, we bring ourselves into being. Mm -hmm. And so God would be the one who brings the world into being. It's breathing in and out consciousness. You know, speaking of the sound of silence, yeah. y you write frequently, you refer to a wonderful story from the Hasidic tradition about what God said when the Ten Commandments were given. Oh, it's, uh, it's a famous tale. Thank, thank you for giving me an excuse to tell it again. Um, uh, it comes to us in the name of Rabbi Mendel Torum of Raimanov. As you know, and many of our, uh, our listeners will know as well, um, there's a tradition that says that God gave the whole five books of Moses on Mount Sinai. Well, that's pushing it because actually it refers to Moses' death and a couple of things, and we might suspect that maybe that wasn't everything that was given. There's another tradition that sort of is a fallback. It says, no, really, God only gave uh, the ten utterances at Mount Sinai, ten commandments. Well, we have another tradition that says, as a matter of fact, God didn't give all ten. All God gave was the first two, which are, if you think about them, kind of like the mirror image of one another. The first one says, I am the Lord your God. The second one says, you can't have any others. It's sort of like God gets all the Jewish people together at the foot of Mount Sinai and says, I have two things to tell you. Number one, I'm God. Number two, you're not. That's an acceptable tradition, too. Mm -hmm. But there's someone else there in the discussion says, no, God didn't even give the first two. All God gave at Sinai was the first one. Now, the first one isn't even a commandment. It's just a statement. I'm the Lord your God, brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Sort of like God says, I'm God and here's my card. 
I free slaves. You can call me anytime. Someone else is present in the discussion, says, wrong again. God didn't even give the first utterance. All God gave was the first word of the first utterance, which is the old Hebrew word anochi, or I. In other words, what God utters is the first person pronoun singular, and in uttering the first person pronoun singular, the assembled, astonished, awestruck Jews at the foot of the mountain say, Oh my God, the universe could say I. If the universe could say I, then it indeed must have a self. There must be a self to all creation. That was all they needed. They say, Moses, you write the rest. We got everything we need and left. Now, Rabbi Mendel Torum of Raimanov comes along and says, you're all wrong. It wasn't the whole Torah, it wasn't the Ten Commandments, it wasn't the first two, it wasn't the first one or even the first word. It was the first letter of the first word, which is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the letter Aleph. And now here's the curveball. It is not, as most people th mistakenly think, a silent letter. It is, as Gershom Sholem, the master historian of Jewish mysticism, points out, the sound that the larynx makes as it clicks into gear. It is therefore the mother of all articulate speech, the softest audible sound imaginable. You make any other noise, mm -hmm. you drown it out. You manage to really shut up, you manage to turn off all the other noise, you could hear the primordial aleph. It is the sound of almost breathing. That's what God says, and according to the Zohar, in that Aleph is contained everything. Yeah. There's a wonderful short story, of course, by you know, Borges. Borges, the, about the, the Aleph. Yes, yeah. the great Argentine Nobel laureate. Now, you mentioned the Zohar. I, I think many of our viewers will not be familiar with that book. Uh, the Zohar really is not a single book. It's a, a collection of many different tracts usually now published in three large uh, folio volumes. And um, it was, most of it was written by Mos Moshe de Leon in, uh, in Spain. In, uh, and uh, it claims to be a commentary on uh, primarily the five uh, books of Moses that help us understand what's really going on beneath the surface of the biblical text. Uh, for a long time, our rabbinic tradition has known that the text must conceal something. In fact, the most powerful way they said it was, the stories in the Bible couldn't be about what they seem to be about, because otherwise we could write better stories. What the Zohar claims is that there is an inner reality to all of being that's not immediately accessible, and that through studying it, we're able to make a greater sense out of our lives. Mm -hmm. And I'll just throw in one other thing. Um, I also think it's the reason why Freud was a Jew, because the, uh, the basic premise of all Freudian thought is that there's something else going on yes. beneath the surface. The unconscious in his right, case. Right. And that for uh, the cognoscenti, for the literati, we are able to every now and then get clearer glimpses of that, understand how it connects everything to everything else.